All right. It is my pleasure to be joined by former 12-year quarterback in the NFL, none other than Kellen Clements. Kellen, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I appreciate you having me on this morning. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I, I mean, you know, it's not every day you get to talk to the person that was sort of mentoring this kid, Justin Herbert, who's just lighting the world on fire as a rookie quarterback. I, I mean, I'm sure you saw this coming in a sense, but how surprised have you been just with how he's been able to really come in with, with a very minor hiccups for, for someone that's seen their first action in the NFL? You know, especially when you think about how – his first real action came to, you know, it came to be with Tyrod's unfortunate injury. Justin had no preseason. Obviously, he had no spring ball. Um, so really a challenging situation for him um, to come into. Um, but I've been really excited for him, how he's handled it. He's obviously played really well. Um, you know, some, some minor growing pains, um, as we all experience. But um, – his ability to come in, distribute the football, doesn't look like he's making a lot of um, judgment errors, if you will, especially getting in and out of plays. I mean, Shane's got him, offensive coordinator Shane Steichen has him checking plays um, just like you would expect a veteran to be doing. Um, and, uh, yeah, very excited for him. I, I can't take any credit to uh, that mentor role, um, but uh, he's, a, he's a good good person um and obviously a good player so i'm just excited for him and his success and how much of that getting success early has mm -hmm. to do with the coaching in this scenario because uh i believe also it's um his quarterback coach um i can't believe i'm blanking on pep hamilton yeah. I, I mean just talk about being in a situation where not that it's you, you can't lose but certainly set up for some success considering the weapons in the team in la as well yeah he, he um you know, it hurt, it hurt Justin because, you know, they lost Pouncey at center early um, and having that veteran presence, especially in, you know, from a protection standpoint, Mike declaration and changing things depending on where the pressure is coming from, um, at, put a little bit more on his plate. But, uh, you know, the guy graduated with like 4.2 or something. So, you know, intellectually it was not going to be a overload for him. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, there is a significant amount of credit that certainly goes to Pep, who, you know, kind of obviously had a bit of a track record for what he was able to do with Andrew Luck his rookie year in Indianapolis. Um, but then also to Shane Steichen, who's putting Justin in a position um, to be successful. And, you know, there's – look, he's, he's not opening the whole thing up. It's not – he's not calling plays or going in um, – with a, a catalog, if you will, like he would have a year ago with Philip and a guy who's been there and played for that long. Um, but Shane has done a really good job. And I, I, was a, I was with Shane when I was there. I think the world of him as an offensive mind, as an offensive coach. Um, but he's done a really good job of putting Justin in position to be successful. And then to Justin's credit, he's capitalized on the opportunity. Right. He certainly has. I, I don't think yeah. anyone expected, no defense expected him to be able to throw the ball as far down the field as he's shown that he can. So I, I think he caught a couple of people by surprise. Yeah, he really has. And, and doing it really with his feet out of position. Um, there's been several throws where the ball has gone a very long way downfield and he hasn't been able to step into it. Um, that was one of the things that really impressed me in seeing it now at this level is his ability to move and slide. I mean, he's obviously a big kid, but move and slide in the pocket and then still deliver accurately way downfield um, is something that's, that's – you can't teach that. Uh, that's, just a, that's just a gift, and he's a big, strong kid that's able to utilize it. Yeah. Now, Justin, of course, is in a position where he's starting, and that may or may not be – be because the team may have taken the number one quarterback out for a little bit, but we're not going to go there. You know, accidents Gracious. happen. But when you think of you know, going back to 2006, you're on the New York Jets. Mm -hmm. Chad Pennington's the starter. Uh, of course, then you did not have the opportunity. Justin did to start. But when you think back, you know, 14 some odd years ago, what was your thought process like just being that young guy, having, you know, an incumbent starter that you're just probably trying to get acclimated to, you know, what's going on? How do I be a good backup? Yeah, golly, that's going, we're going back in time now, bud. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what, that, it's such a, which makes it even that much more impressive of what Justin has been able to do. But 
I remember that first year, I, I didn't even know what I didn't know. And so that was the first thing I was trying to do was just figure out how things worked. And I, I remember, I remember very specifically how blown away I was. I mean, it staggered me a little bit, just the business side of professional sports. Um, and, you know, you're used to college at that point, at that point in time when I was, now we're going back even more than 14 years, but, you know, guys would commit to a school, they'd sign their letter of intent and you were there for four or five years. There wasn't all the transfers and everything that you see now. So I was used to that con continuity of a roster. And I get to, the, to New York and I remember the locker next to me uh, over a 16 week season had like 12 different guys in it. It was crazy. It was just a revolving door. And that was the, that was the case with kind of that bottom eight, nine, 10 spots of the roster. And that, that really staggered me. So I was just trying to get my bearings straight, figure out, you know, what's expected of me. Now it's, pro now it's professional. We're not amateurs. Now we're pros. Um, how to prepare because it was totally different. Um, and I have to give a ton of credit to Chad um, because, um, he didn't have to be the veteran that he was to me. Um, he's a, he's a great man. Um, taught me a lot about ball, but taught me also just how to operate as a husband. We were, I was married already. Um, he was obviously married and had some kids. Um, during my time while I was there with him, I had our first, um, my wife had our first, <laughs> I was there, um, you know, played my role in the process, but, um, you, but taught me how to be a husband and a father and to balance all of that. Um, and uh, so I was very fortunate to be in that position, but that first year was, was very challenging for me. I was, too, I was coming off of an injury too. My senior year at Oregon got cut short cause I broke my leg. So, you know, trying to figure out and kind of get through some of the, um, the, the, the mental part of it, you know, just kind of worried how, how is this going to be when I get hit? for the first time. Um, so, um, yeah, it was a challenge that first year. It really was. I wasn't really ready to play until my second year when I was kind of like, I've right, been here, understand what's expected of me. And beyond that, you got the reps your second year to actually get out there yeah. and, and really start to see, you know, test it, push it. Um, but I, I, I want to go back to what you said about your senior year, because I, I mean, you were on pace to at least be a Heisman finalist with, with uh, Oregon ushering in the spread offense, right? I mean, what Joey Harrington did was great, but this was the the beginning of what Oregon would, you know, begin to do and, and be known yeah. for for the following decade. How much did that throw you for a loop, switching to the spread, then trying to learn a new NFL offense with what Brian Schottenheimer was running? Yeah, the the <clears throat> it was interesting. My senior year, we hired an offensive coordinator. Uh, we hired Gary Croton and we kind of took some of what Urban Meyer was, had been doing at Utah. Um, and that, you know, before he went to Florida and we were kind of on the beginning of that trend, you know, that ended up taking over college football for the most part. Um, we were very basic in what we're doing, but I loved it because it was fast paced. We're throwing it all over. I'm not overly fast, but I could, you know, be just enough of a threat to maybe keep a defensive end um, honest for a little bit in some of that read option stuff. Um, but we went from that um, and, you know, we were, we were rolling pretty good for my senior year. And then, and they, they continued to roll even after I got hurt, which was, you know, we, we had a talented roster. Um, and then you kind of switch and go to, you know, what Shoddy was running, which, you know, to be honest, that the plays are all the same. It's just the language, especially when not so much the plays are the same, although there's carryover from college to pros, but the plays, the core plays, everybody's running them because they work and they've worked for the last 15 or 20 years. So everybody's running them. Everybody has their tweaks, but the biggest challenge is just learning how to speak the language. Um, and, um, and that was, a, that was different. You know, that I think the preparation in the run game, it wasn't so much anymore just, well, I see the shaded nose and that's where I'm going to run it. Now you were expected to know, everybody's blocking assignment as a quarterback so that I can direct traffic if I needed to. So the responsibility that was on my plate and the same with protection, same in the past game. So that was, there was just more that you were responsible for understanding. Um, 
but uh but we got there and once you get it's just a grind it's like anything else that you start this new it was a grind once you get there then you can take a deep breath and and uh and kind of enjoy the fruits of your labor of, of learning it yeah so i'd have to imagine you feel like you're progressing as a professional 06 you know 07 you get some playing time under your belt yep. so can, can you unpack the Brett Favre saga for you through your eyes. <laughs> I mean, you know that I have to go here, right? Because it yeah, shapes yeah, yeah. up like second round pick. The guy has some playing time, like third year, this should be his time. I mean, how, how did you learn that they were going to bring him in? And honestly, how did you feel about not getting your shot? Yeah, it was interesting. The, the whole experience in New York was, was, was interesting. It was character building in a lot of ways. Um, I can still remember that because we were in Cleveland um the night before the i think it was the first preseason game and chad was there um you know evening meetings whatever go back to the hotel room and for some reason i was still awake and the phone rings and it was eric mangini who's the head coach hey just a heads up we just traded for brett da, 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 da. he'll probably be here tomorrow okay i mean it's just kind of like just giving you a heads up it's not like i could stop it it's not like i could um do anything you know it's just and i ended up um i ended up actually calling chad that night and we talked for quite a while chad by that time we'd been together a couple years so this is going into year three for me and we were very close at the time and just you know because i was what's going to happen to chad and then they you know they ended up releasing him he goes to miami comes back and beats us in week 17 i think so that miami goes to the playoffs um and uh yeah it was just it was weird because i grew up like I grew up, it was Joe Montana. And then when Joe retired, I was Brett Favre. I mean, he was my, he was my guy. He was who I tried to emulate on Friday nights running around the, you know, at Burns high school. Um, and so when he walked into the locker room, it was, it was weird, Steve, because it wasn't really about me. I was, you know, and what, whatever opportunity was there that I had, you know, that was now no longer there. Um, it was just, it was my hero walked into the locker room and I got to play catch with him and I got to sit in meetings with him for the year. And uh, so it was, it was crazy. And we started out hot. I want to think we went, we went eight and two, um, started out eight and two. And then, um, and then it kind of slid from there and we missed the playoffs. I, I can't remember what we ended up nine and seven, maybe eight and nine and seven, 10 and six, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was winter get in, I think, at the end for uh, us and Miami and Chad came back to New York and beat us somewhat ironic, almost poetic. They say never meet your heroes. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, it was, he lived up to the hype. Let okay. me put it that way. He lived up to the hype and it was, it was cool because he'd been, I, I'm, I, now I'm giving approximates. I would, he been 16 years, 17 years in green Bay. So we can he came there and we had one year of, the his best stuff his best stories his best one-liners i'm telling you if if you know if i could change the names and have it still be as impactful the stories that i could write in a book would be i'd be a bit be I, i'd sell a few copies i would sell a few copies i'd never do it because you know that what's in the you know this happens in the in the circle stays in the circle but um it was it was fan. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was just, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was an incredible year. It really was to just sit there. And I was like, this guy, that's Brett stinking far. I remember seeing him do stuff at practice and I'm like, humanly, that's not possible. That man was doing it at 38. I think he was at the time. Yeah. Give or take. Yeah. Give or take. I'm, worried. I'm like, Oh my give that I've never Mahomes has some very, very special talents. Rogers has some very special, but I just hadn't seen a ball come out of a human's hands the way it came out of Brett Favre's hands, even at 38. It was crazy. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, so that was 08. That was 08. It was a crazy ride. I, I, I'm glad I asked. Now, yeah, yeah. because of everything you just said, it, it was palatable in a way because of what the experience was for you. But if you just fast forward one more year... I mean, it's it just sort of, you want to talk about this, it's just sort of oh, like, yeah. how, <laughs> how yeah, do you yeah. now be like, okay, well, I guess maybe the, the organization doesn't think too highly of me. I, I mean, what, what's going on here? I mean. Yeah, well, you, so 
I never went there. Um, you know, in 08, it's like, well, we traded for Brett Favre. He's going to the Hall of Fame. He's one of the best ever. Okay, I understand that. Um, we don't make the playoffs. They fire Eric. They hire Rex. Um, and I wasn't Rex's guy. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're going into the – we go through this first mini camp. And I get a call from – who's the first one that called? My agent. Um, I get a call from my agent on draft day, and I wasn't watching because it doesn't do me any good to watch. Um, I get a call from my agent. He's like, hey, are you watching this? I'm like, no. I didn't even watch the draft that I got drafted in. Um, and uh, he's like, well, they just traded up. They're taking Sanchez number five overall. And I was like, well, okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing as when they, tra- when they trade for Brett. It's like, well, I – Okay. Um, and they called, you know, and said, Hey, we're doing this. Um, you're not going anywhere, da, 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 da. but you know, it's like, what, what am I going to do? Um, so I tried to take the same approach with Sanchez that Chad had taken with me and you now I'm going to try to compete and keep him on the bench as long as I can. But you understand that the inevitable, it's the same for, you know, it's the same for Tyrod, you know, and, and everybody else in Tyrod, unfortunately, it's happened Patrick to him. too twice Fitzpatrick same thing I mean that guy Fitzy's playing pretty good they're three and three and then it just happens um so yeah I you just you know I was there for two years with Mark and I liked Mark um tried to help as much as I can but you know at that point you know I have no I'm not long term here I have no long term future here so um you have to try to kind of put on your professional hat grab your um, grab your lunch pail, go to work, do the best you can, and try to control the things that you can control at that point. And my reactions and my emotions were within my control, and so I tried to control them. So, you know, you said from the, the time you got there, right, the, that revolving jersey that you could see from <laughs> your own uh, yeah. walker, and now yeah, yeah. You, you see the trades year after year that, you know, personally affect you in, in your position on the team. Yeah, so yeah. by the time – 2011 rolls around I I'd have to imagine in a sense you were getting a little bit numb to the business side of it you would probably come to expect that it was going to be a cold hard world out there trying to make it yep totally understood it by that point so what was the the mental roller coaster of just trying to find the next spot because 2011 I'm sure didn't go the way you drew it up with with moving across country multiple times yeah that was a you know it's funny and I I'm glad that you asked and I I just want to also add to that are you moving your family each and every time this is happening well I'll tell you (laughs) um so yeah we have um and I'm glad that you asked because it's um Professional athletics isn't always the romantic thing that, you know, we dream of as kids um, and, you know, or even, you know, the casual fan who watches on Sunday. It's not what it is for most of us isn't what it is for the people that we idolize. I mean, you know, although even Brett Favre played for three teams. So, um, but I, so 2011 is the lockout year, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I was there five years. So 2011 is the lockout year. So I leave New York. Um, after we lose in the AFC championship, I can, I know that I'm not coming back. Um, and 2011 is the lockout year. So there's no spring ball. There's no nothing. So we're just kind of hanging out, which was, it was kind of nice. You know, it's good family time. You're a little bit worried. You know, you don't know, you have no idea financially what the future holds. Um, when everything finally gets, we get the new CBA, everything goes, I get signed. I get a call from Washington. Um, you know, the new Washington football team. And uh, I get called uh, to go out there. And I'm like, all right, perfect. It's Rex Grossman. It's John Beck. I'm like, I can compete. Yeah, I got a chance to come in and compete. Um, And I was a little bit behind the eight ball. They'd both been there the year before. I played okay in the preseason. But you get done with that last preseason game, and it's like, I'm – getting cut was not even in my mind. My family, so we played the last preseason game, you know, on Thursday, back when there was preseason. My family flew in on, so I have a wife and two kids at the time. They flew in Wednesday night, come to the game Thursday. I had already rented a house from Chris Cooley, actually. Um, he had an extra house that he rented. So I'd already rented and kind of in our days off, I was kind of moving furniture in and stuff. Um, family comes out. I play good, actually, Thursday night. Um, 
So we, you know, we wake up Friday morning, it's that day off, it's Black Friday when they're cutting everybody and it's not even in my radar and I get the call, Washington Redskins, never a good call. Um, and uh, hey, you know, we're going in a different direction, come on in, bring your playbook, et cetera. And I was like, holy, holy cow. I mean, that was, that was the first time in my athletic career that I was told you're not good enough to be on the playground and play with us right now. You need to sit over there and play hopscotch or whatever. Um, and uh, so I did that, kind of I called the movers back, come get the stuff, you know, and we just like, all right, we're done. And I was fortunate, Chris was, Chris was good to me about it. He's like, don't worry about it. You know, as far as like the rest of my rental, um, which I was appreciative of. Um, and uh, so I went back, we just bought a house up here in Washington state. So we went back here. Um, and then you get a couple workouts um, and, uh, and your cattle when you go to these workouts and these tryouts, I mean, your cattle, they bring you in, they run you through the shoots, look at you, make you do some exercises, throw a few balls, put you on a plane and send you home. So I was starting to think maybe I'm done. When Matt Schaub got hurt in Houston, I go to Houston. Um, I'm there for two weeks, don't dress for any games. And they cut me and they cut me again. I'm like, I'm, that's it. I'm done. Now I've been cut twice. My career has I, I've done that's it and to be honest with you Steve I would have been the guy that had regrets at that point and had some like had that bitter taste in my mouth if you will um and uh I got up am I being too long-winded not at all okay you can just kind of tell me to wrap it up but whatever I, it's an interesting story I get off the plane up here and uh in Washington my wife picks me up we go to Red Robin and uh, uh, and I get the call from the GM of the Rams. It was like, how soon can you get on an airplane? We just claimed you off waivers. I was like, I just got off a plane. I mean, technically, I'm eight minutes from the airport. I just, you know, I'm like, we're, I'm at Red Robin. He, he was like, he, he was really cool. He said, look, I'll tell him we can't get you a flight out. Have, stay the night with your family. It's not like you're going to play this weekend anyway, and then we'll get you a flight the next morning. So I do that. We go to – I ended up having to – anyway, there's four games left. I ended up being the backup for that first week and then started the last three in the, with the Rams. And it was interesting, Steve, because my whole career up to that point, I had, I had tried to kind of be what the coach had wanted me to be. You know, when Eric Mangini told me all the great things that Tom Brady had done, and so I was like, okay, this is what I got to do. This is what it looks like in this. Or I tried to emulate Chad Pennington, or I tried to emulate Brett Favre. And, um, and through all of that, I wasn't being true to myself. And I'm, they're absolutely, it's necessary and important to learn from other people. But somewhere in that, you can't lose who you are as a player. And I had done that, which is why I'd make the comment, if I'd gotten cut and never gotten to play again, I would have had those regrets. Because I went out for those three games. I was like, this is it. My career is pretty much dead, but I have, you know, like a little bit of a pulse left. I got three games left to just play a game that I love to play. And I said, if I'm going down, I'm going to do it, doing it the way that I want to do it. And I just played because I loved the game. And it was the best decision that I could have made in my career because it, it I just played. And I wasn't. I didn't think I didn't, I just played because I love playing. Um, and we, you know, we lost all three games, but um, I played good enough to get another gig and then kind of got second life from there. But yeah, 2011 was a, was a, was a trip. My family did not come with me to Houston and they did not come with me to St. Louis. So I was away from them for those six and a half weeks. I flew back Christmas night and got to have a pseudo Christmas with them and then had to turn around and go back for the last week. Um, but I didn't get Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, 2011 was a crazy year. It's just, it's crazy how things work, right? Because you're going into those three games thinking that, you know, it's the two minute drill of your career. Little did you know it was a two minute drill before halftime based yes. off of what you had done. It, you know, it opens up an entire, you know, next half of your career. That's a so great you, analogy. I'd imagine that prior to you could play the what if game forever you know what if i never break my ankle i get drafted by a different team what's the different organization do for me what if you know brett Favre? you have all these different what if scenarios in your head mm -hmm. and now you finally just get a chance to go out there and you know you, you play like you, there's nothing to lose and yep. 
lo and behold. And lo and behold. And it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a great, in my mind, I was coming down the 18th fairway, you know, it's getting dark. It's kind of one of those deals where it's like, all right, not a lot of practice swings here because <laughs> I'm just trying to finish this round. And, uh, and yeah, and come to find out I had a whole nother 18 to play, um, or I was just coming down nine. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, and it was, who was it? I think it might've been Chad. I, Chad gave me so many great one-liners of just things to just hold on to. Um, but I, I was told early, you know, you talk about two circles and you have the, the circle you, of things that you're concerned with, you know, oh, are they going to draft Sanchez? Are they going to trade for Favre? The year before that was, are they going to, are they trading for Cutler? Are they did it, did it, did it, did it, whatever. Um, but somewhere inside of that circle is, is your circle is, is a circle of, con of control, right? And the idea is to match your circle of concern to the circle of control, right? I'm only going to concern myself with the things that I actually have control over. Um, and, and I got to a point eventually where I was able to do that and compartmentalize the other junk that just clutters you and can spin you off into all sorts of very bad places. And I, I mean, that's, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, fight or flight. You know, if you want to fight, that's what you have to do to stay in the game. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to handle it all and you're, you're not going to last. I, I mean, there's just, just there's too much to, to, to constantly be worrying. It is. I mean, thinking about my rookie year, I'm like, you know, the, and the revolving door that was the locker next to me, I felt bad for him. And even when I was in the position where I was that guy, I can't, all I can do is what I can do. All I can do is prepare as much as I can, work out in the summers, make sure that I'm ready. And if it happens, I mean, sometimes it's just, damn, it's just bad luck. It really, sometimes they just trade for a Hall of Famer and I don't know that there was anything I could have done in my first two years that would have made them not trade for a Hall of Famer. I just, I don't think there really is. Um, uh, so anyway. Now you talked a little bit about staying ready. Can you just expand a little bit about you know, staying ready week to week, being a backup quarterback, you know, how hard is it actually to act as if you're the rep? Uh, I'm sorry, act as if you're the starter, get all the reps you can as if you're playing knowing that it's unlikely that you will barring an injury or something unforeseen. Yeah. Knowing that best case scenario for the team is that you just sit over there with your ball cap on. It's, um, it's difficult. And it, and it's, it's, um, it's, it is, it's a challenge. And earlier in my career was more of a challenge than it was later. Um, a for two reasons. One, because I didn't have the, the accrued reps. You know, so I couldn't go back and, um, uh, and, and draw on previous experiences from a year before, three years before, five years before. Um, so that was difficult. It's also more difficult as a young guy because you want to play. You know, I want to be out there. Chad's out there. I'm rooting for Chad. Brett's out there. I'm rooting for Brett. Mark's out there. I'm rooting. But at, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I want to play. I don't, you don't ever go to a pickup basketball game and just be like, you guys are good. I'm just here to watch. I'm just, no, nobody does that. Um, and, and so it's difficult when you're younger because of a combination of the desire to play. And I haven't, I don't have the reps yet. Um, as I got older, you know, I, I, I realized, especially about the time I got to St. Louis, as I, when I came back to St. Louis as a free agent, Sam Bradford's there. I thought very highly of Sam, both as a player and a person. Um, so I realized there was a niche for me at that time where I could feel kind of what, essentially what Josh McCown has done, um, you know, that, and Josh can play, I would say Josh is a better player than myself, but the man has played for, you know, however many teams and he's, but he's always been that mentor role. He filled it very well. Um, and it, helped it a lot makes of me players. think of, um, Mark Brunel getting signed. Brunel. 100%. Yep. Brunel is the same exact way. And that's why they brought Mark in my second year in New or my Sanchez's second year, um, you know, was to do that for Sanchez because I wasn't ready to do that. I didn't have the experience yet. Um, and um, anyway, but you, you transition into a place where really all I truly want is just the best thing for this starter. And through practice preseason and what times I have played, I've uh, I now I have enough reps. 
Um, but it takes a, a high degree of focus to, you know, because essentially you're, you're wasting your time. I mean, really, in best case scenarios, you are completely wasting your time with all the film that you're watching, all of the, you know, the studying that you're doing of the game plan. Best case scenario is that you are completely wasting your time. And that took me a little bit to wrap my head around. Um, but it's, you know, it's, that was, you talk about the professional side of the business. That was my job. My job was to be prepared so that if, God forbid, the starter went down, I could come in and do an adequate job get us get us through that game and or that series or whatever it might be yeah uh, i mean it, everything that we've just talked about I, I think really adds a lot of color to you know how you ended up being you know who you are today all the things that you had to go through and how it prepares you for life after being a pro athlete but before i ask you about that just when you think about, you know, the, the different, and there's so many head coaches, OCs, QB coaches that you've had mm. and the teams that you've been on, mm -hmm. do you, not that it's any particular person, but are there particular themes or characteristics that you would consistently see in great coaches or great teams since you were around so many over the years? Yeah, I think that, um, there's two things. Um, one is when you're talking about the locker room um, and I was a part of some that were cancerous um, where you knew as soon as guy, you, you know, there's always, there's always some guys, um, you know, when things start to go bad that, you know, are going to be the first ones to bail, um, you know, whether that's just emotionally bail, um, physically bail sometimes, um, and I was in a couple of locker rooms where you knew that you were just a two game losing streak away from the thing just imploding. Um, and I was in some locker rooms where, uh, you knew that it didn't matter. And, and there was a, there was a completely different feel in those locker rooms, you know, lose a game, lose a couple games, lose a guy to injury. That was really important. You just, you knew that you were going to be able to rally. Um, you knew that the guys were there for one another you knew that guys cared um, and were, were and would put the team first, um, you know, for what we did, what we needed to do. Um, and I think that the great coaches that I was around understood that and respected that um, and appreciated that and gave it, um, gave it its due, if you will. They, they drafted the right people. They, um, they signed the right free agents to do that. Um, and, uh, and it was different. It was a different feel um, in the locker room when you had those types of guys. It was an enjoyable environment to go to work and it was a culture that you, you wanted to be a part of um, versus the other one where it was very clear. It's like, well, we're just, we're just a bunch of mercenaries, if you will, that are hired to go out and convert third downs or, or, you know, try to get turnovers and sack the quarterback. But when, you know, as soon as that whistle blows at the end, everybody go back to their corner and don't talk to me. And it's just not a recipe for success. It's not a formula for success. Um, right. And I saw both sides of it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, fortunately, it's a good experience. Yeah, the, the dichotomy of what it's like. I, I mean, it makes you, gives you the, the level of perspective to know what yeah. to appreciate. Yeah, absolutely um, does. Yeah. Well, you know, after a, a nice few years in LA, you were able to you know, take the ride north, go back home, and, and yeah. decide what to do after being an athlete. So, uh, from what I could see, uh, maybe you've looked at doing a little bit of real estate, but you're working yeah. with a late us. <laughs> yeah, um, I did. I dabbled in the real estate thing a little bit just because um, uh, it was specifically in agriculture because I grew up on a cattle ranch, and so I thought I knew the clientele, which it was good. It wasn't, it wasn't the right fit for me. Um, and, uh, and I got, I got contacted by one of the partners at the latest, um, that, um, they've started, they've started this company. We have a, um, uh, behavioral assessment tool that, um, helping, um, corporations recruit, build and develop teams. It's funny because you talked about teams. That was one of the, it was one of the, ways that I kind of carved out a niche, if you will. I mean, it was part of, it was partly my ability to help and support the starter, be that Sam or Philip, you know, in LA, San Diego slash LA, but it was also my ability to, to monitor and, and facilitate um, 
you know, amid my teammates in the locker room. So we're doing that now in the corporate world, which has been very fulfilling for me. Um, um, and then I have, I'm using some of the outputs um, from this behavioral assessment tool is called PRISM. I'm using some of the outputs for that to help um, on, the sports, on the sports side. We've created a one page document to help coaches um, understand an athlete, right? I wanna reach you where you are. I'm not gonna coach you. My, my thought is that coaching is not a one size fits all. I can't coach you the same way that I coach John, the same way that I coach Jimmy and the same way that I coach Sarah, whoever. It's not the same. You guys have different preferences. So we have, um, we have unlocked, if you will, the ability to understand you as an athlete from the moment that you step on college, on campus as a collegiate athlete or the moment after you get drafted as a professional athlete, the ability for a coach to understand your preferences on how you want to be, um, on how to engage you and communicate with you, how you want to be taught and how you want to be motivated so that, that a coach um, is able to understand and reach you better, right? We, the, we, what we, we call it the speed of performance guide and the ability to get you firing on all cylinders. You know, I, I, w I wouldn't go out and buy a new pickup and not ask, well, what type of gas, what type of fuel is this thing used? Uh, I tried, I plugged it in and it wouldn't start. It was not electric. And then I ran some gas in it. That didn't work. And oh, oh, now I find out, you know, 12 months later, oh, it's a diesel. You just, let's find out from day one what is going to make this athlete tick. So it's been incredibly fulfilling for, for me. It's um, we've only been at it for a latest has been at it for a couple of years. So, you know, it's a grind right now in the buildup. Um, but we've got some, some wins already in 2020, even amid the pandemic, which was really good. Um, and, uh, and um, I've got some great stuff going on the sports side and the corporate side. So it's been really good. And I think what we're doing is, it's really making an impact for teams on some, on the team building side of it, be that corporate or on the sports side. So that part for me, it, that part for me um, kind of gets my blood flowing a little bit. Um, I enjoy that part of it. So it's been very, I'm excited about the future. That's awesome. That, that, that's yeah. great. You know, that you just like you thought maybe your career was over, but it ended up there being another chapter, you know, certainly there's many chapters after being an athlete. So for you to be able to continue to write the succeeding chapters with something that really gets you going is the, the most important thing is to just not be stuck in that rut. Well, it's funny. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting as athletes. And again, I go back to Chad. Chad told me my rookie year is like, listen, this is what you do. It's not who you are. And I think as athletes, when we're done playing, because we've had that identity in sports for so long. I mean, even going back, to, if you played in college, you were a pretty dang good high school athlete. And the people around town, around school, probably identified you as, oh, that's so-and-so the basketball player. That's so-and-so the lacrosse player. That's whatever. And then it's the same thing in college and it's the same thing in the pros if you're fortunate to get continue to go. But at some point it ends for all of us. I mean, at some point it ends. And who are you without sports, I think, is something that athletes lose sight of. Um, and, um, and, you know, because, you know, God willing, you're done playing, even if you play until 30 God willing, you've still got 60% of your life waiting for you. Um, so, you know, you have to make the preparations for, you know, A, for what are you going to do, but also understand that, you know, your identity is largely going to be something else other than sports. And I was fortunate for that to get that advice from Chad and have tried to imply it as much as possible. Uh, now, uh... I want to end on asking you what's the best piece of advice, but I, I do want to just quickly squeeze in here, you know, for you to know who you are outside of being an athlete you, mm -hmm. in the research I had done prior to us jumping on this call is it seems like your faith is a very important part of your life. So Huge. I don't think it would be, it, it wouldn't make any sense if I were to talk to you, ask you about how you were successful, this, that, the other thing and not yeah. bring up this important pillar. So did you mind just speaking on how that has helped you throughout your life as well? No, I appreciate that. Um, and it, it, it goes into really what I was just talking about because my, my true identity and where I draw my strength is from my Catholic faith. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, sports is going to come and go, but that pillar of my life is something that's always going to be there and, and can't, thankfully, be taken away. It's the one thing that can't be taken away. 
Um, and, you know, there were during the times of, you know, adversity, be that in college, you know, I, you know, I mean, we kind of, we talked about earlier, I break my leg, I go to New York. Okay. Then they trade for far. Then they sign Sanchez. Then I get cut a bunch of times. I was able to bounce, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it wasn't difficult, but I was able to bounce back from that. I think largely because I surrendered a long time ago, I realized that it's not my plan. Um, and, um, and so I, you know, in time, in those times of difficult, I mean, I, I was a senior, I'm going back to that, to, to the broken leg in college. I remember laying there going, damn, I, th- I was start. I was in the run for the Heisman and I wasn't going to win. There was some guy named Reggie Bush at USC. I know I wasn't going to win, but it's just kind of cool to see my name and Heisman in the same sentence. So I, you know, I had no illusions about where I was going to finish. Um, but it was just kind of cool. Um, but I remember laying there, I was on the, I was on the plane right where at Arizona, where I was on the plane on the way back and I got three seats to myself. That was good. Cause I had a broken leg. Um, but I remember just going, this isn't, this is now what's supposed to happen. And I kind of started to feel sorry for myself. Um, and, uh, and my sister wrote me a note um, talking about, you know, for if, if you're religious or whatnot, but talking about how the blessed mother had, um, given of her, you know, it's not my will, but your will. And, and I, and it just, and it shocked me. It hit me. I was like, this isn't about me. Um, and, and, um, and so I, I, at that point I was like, okay. And I, and I, I leaned on my, I was like, all right, God, whatever it is that you're, what did you're doing right now? I don't understand it. And that's okay. Cause I don't need to, my job is to just walk through the next door that you open. And I tried to take that approach to, um, everything that came up. Um, and, uh, but it's, you know, our faith is very important. It's how my wife is Catholic. And so we're raising our kids Catholic and, um, and hopefully that they can have that same strength and foundation that I was fortunate that my parents gave me growing up. That's awesome. I appreciate you asking. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, as I alluded to, and to wrap this whole thing up after everything we talked about, man. Yeah what's the one best piece of advice that you would give to a young student athlete that is hoping to have any sort of success in their life? Gosh, it'd be pretty cliche to just forward one of the things, one of the many ones that Chad gave me. Um, I, I just, I think what gets lost, there's two things that gets lost right now. Um, one is, is, is hard work is underappreciated. Um, I, I carved out a 12 year career, not because I was the most physically gifted. Um, you know, I mean, after that year, three, four, five, they were always trying to replace me. And, and I, 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 I didn't survive because I was, you know, I could run faster, throw harder, whatever. I just outworked everybody. Um, and, um, and so I think that the, the first thing is that there's, there's absolutely no substitute for hard work. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, it's not always going to go your way. Um, but I think resilience is underappreciated sometimes in athletics. Um, you know, it, don't get me started on participation trophies. God forbid if some kid as a fifth grader is disappointed that we finished third and didn't get a trophy. So what? It happens. So what? I mean, it, anyway, sorry. But, um, but I think you just understand that, that it's not going to go your way. It's not. You're going to lose games. You're going to lose games. You're going to um, get injured. It's not going to go your way. But what tells more about you than the winning is how you handle the losses and how you handle the adversity that comes up. Those are the things. I mean, we said it, 60% probably more of your life is going to be spent outside of athletics. So use those the lessons that are taught by from athletics at any level and apply them because you're going to, you know, this, the sports thing, I'll circle it all the way back to Chad. The sports thing is it's what you do. It might be what you love, but it's not who you are. And so um, make sure that you're just using those opportunities to prepare for life after sport. Well, there you have it. Long winded bit, but maybe you can no, it was perfect. I said, I appreciate all of it, you know, Kellen, uh, uh, such great insights, you know, all the way through. I thank you so much for, for taking the time. No, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on, uh, having me on. This was, uh, 
this was fun. I, well, you went back, we went back in time a little bit. I hadn't thought about some of those in, uh, in a while.